When a fighter patrol is defending friendly airspace, it can be easy to get overwhelmed with the radar screen filled with contacts. The pilots protecting that airspace need a quick and easy way to make sense of all the returns. They do that by organizing them into groups. This way they can be quickly categorized so a friendly fighter patrol can handle them. This cuts down on the amount of radio traffic needed and makes it easier to coordinate a defense. So how exactly does this process of grouping happen? In this video, we'll answer that question. We know that defended airspace is divided into lanes that are occupied by DCA cap flights overseen by controllers. In a large battle space, it can get pretty cluttered. Without proper guidance, the wrong interceptors will waste precious fuel making unnecessary intercepts. To get the right interceptors out to the right targets, you need a solid communications plan. That plan will come in two parts. First, different radio frequencies will be assigned for each function. So you might see a scenario where each controller has a distinct frequency. There might even be a separate channel for check-ins, which we covered in detail in this video. The second part of that plan is to use a common set of brevity terms to keep communication concise. That brevity starts with identifying all the assets in the air. We do that by putting those assets into groups. A group is the way TAC C2 and aircraft describe other air assets and is used to describe unknown or enemy aircraft. Groups are made up of contacts which are just individual radar returns. Contacts are considered part of the same group when they are within three nautical miles of each other. The number of contacts in a group is called its strength. There's also a special rule here. Unless specified otherwise, a group is considered to have a strength of one contact. So this could end up like the example on screen now. This is something an AWACS controller might send over the radio to a fighter called Viper 1-1. I go over bullseye in greater detail in its own video. Since the strength was not given, we can safely assume there is only one radar contact in this group. Now we see this identified as a single group. This means there aren't any other groups that the controller wants to include because they may be friendly aircraft. Or they are so far outside of the area that they are not a concern. Or they may be the only one. Now there are some other descriptors that can be used, like the following. Each of these is based on range, and there are two ranges we are concerned with targeting range and threat range. Targeting range is a distance agreed to by the fighters and their controllers during planning. It's used for targeting fighters on hostile aircraft, so it's not one fixed number for everyone. It changes based on mission needs. Whenever a newly detected group is outside targeting range, it's an additional group. Threat range is also decided on during planning, but it does have a default just in case. That default is 35 nautical miles. Any new groups within threat range are labeled threat group. Now if a new group pops up between threat and targeting range, then it's a pop-up group. Sometimes you have multiple groups, and you need a way to tell them apart from each other. There are a few ways we can do this. You can specify a cardinal relationship. So this would be called north group, and this would be south group. Range relationship is another method. In this example, this group that's closer to the cap is lead group, while the one in the back is trail group. Unlike using cardinals, this one will only make sense from the perspective of a specific aircraft. Range and cardinal direction can also be combined like this. North lead group would mean this one. Additionally, you can use a unique position as a reference. This includes bullseye, bra format, or geographic references. There's an entire video devoted to all these if you want to learn more. Now let's take a look at an example of this in action. A DCA camp with the call sign of Showtime 1-1 is on patrol with two groups of unidentified aircraft in the area. Showtime 1-1, West Group, at Bullseye, 39,000, Track North, Hostel. In one short call, Showtime 1-1 learned that the Westmost Group is at their pre-briefed Bullseye location on the map. That group is at 39,000 feet, heading towards the north, and the controller has identified it as hostile. In fact, everyone on the channel now knows that too. It's quick and to the point. Now that we know a little bit about describing a group, let's talk about how multiple groups are handled. Multiple groups can be described in a single radio call, so you might hear something like this. Viper, two groups, range 30, track east. Lead group, Bullseye, 135, 
20. 35,000, hostile. Trail group, 20,000, hostile. At the beginning, we see that two groups are identified and they are 30 miles from each other heading east. The lead group is 20 miles from Bullseye on a bearing of 135, which is southeast. We also know the altitudes of both groups and that they're hostile. If the groups are not flying in trail, then the azimuth can be used. So if they were side by side like this with 25 mile separation, then this call would start with two groups, azimuth 25. So far we've talked about groups that are labeled as either a single group or two groups separated by either range or azimuth. But they can also have these formations. Vic and Champagne are V-shaped formations of three or more groups, with the difference being which way the opening faces. These will come with a set of dimensions describing the area they cover, so they'll sound like this. Viper 3 Group Vic, 15 deep, 20 wide, lead group Bullseye 23017, 32,000. This group covers an area 15 miles deep and 20 wide. From there, the controller would go through all the groups like normal. Wall and ladder are used when formations are in a line. Ladder means the line points at a friendly group. Wall is perpendicular to that. In either case, use the words deep or wide to describe the total distance across the formation. So a ladder might sound like this. Eagle, three group, ladder, 30 deep. Lead group, bullseye, 22510, 30,000, hostile. This would indicate that the distance between the lead group and the very last group is 30 miles. With the wall, deep would be replaced with wide. These are the standard labels for groups. There are a lot more or less common labels though, but they can get really repetitive, so I'm going to leave it here to keep this video from going on too long. But the labels we've covered so far should be enough to get a good grasp of the fundamentals. Collectively, these group descriptions are known as a picture. The picture is a good way to get situational awareness in a fighter's patrol area. But I want to point out something crucial here. In the real world, the controller will limit what goes into the picture so that it only contains groups that are relevant to the recipient of the radio call. In other words, it would only be about the groups a particular cap flight would care about, not everything in the air. There's already a lot a fighter pilot has to focus on, so keeping radio chatter to things that are relevant is important. For the most part, that means contacts that are in or near to a fighter's lane. Anything outside of that is extraneous. This is something that's important to know for those of you that want to practice this in DCS. The automated AWACS in DCS does not recognize any lanes. In fact, it views the entire game world as everyone's lane. So a picture can potentially be filled with a lot of clutter. That doesn't help anyone. So keep that in mind before you ask for a picture, or you might get a lot of unhelpful information while also blocking other players from accessing the AWACS. In this video, we talked about how a controller would relay information about groups operating in a DCA caps lane. But what happens when the decision is made to intercept one of those groups? That decision is called a commit. And as we continue this series, we'll go over what's involved when a cap commits to an intercept. So I hope you'll come back for that one, and as always, thanks for watching.